point from the clinical researcher's point of view, being between the, the patient, being the advisor to the patient, and the scientists and the industry who are developing these compounds and these new treatments and these uh, new technologies. And I think we, what I learned from here is really that we need to work on the continuum of all the parties involved from the scientist to the applicant, which is in, in this case then the physician, to the end user who is at the end the patient. And I think at the moment we are not yet really good in enabling this uh, seamless collaboration. Now the next presentation is uh, uh, from Nicola Stingelin and uh, you will see she's a passionate ethicist with lots of experience in benefit risk assessment, in thinking about the, the real ethical considerations um, in research with humans and in particular now also she will present her thoughts about um, the ethical aspects in nanomedicine development and uh, so I leave the rest to you. Nicole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see friends from Basel. I used to do the teaching, so you now work with somebody else, but hi, great to see the younger generation. And just to make a point, I mean, it's really great in Basel, it's one of the European important nano centers, go. It's one of the strengths of the university, and we do give some time to nano ethics there. Go, super. <laughs> okay, I mean, I now at this moment feel completely like a fish out of water, and I don't know where I'm gonna be coming from from you guys, so I hope I'm gonna bring you something and be, halfway uh, coherent. So we've heard the researcher's voice, the patient's voice, now it's the voice of the ethicist. And this reminds me, if we've got any English-speaking people, of the Canterbury Tales, which are quite vulgar little ditties. And so now we've got the voice of the ethicist coming. And what I'm gonna be doing is, is not as interesting, I think, as what the other speakers have done, because ethics, of course, is rather analytical and dry, and to a certain extent, really quite boring in the sense that we can be passionate about being analytical, but that's as far as the passion should really go. And I'm gonna be staking out some nanoethics field and giving some inputs. And what I've, what, what I've done is that I was sent these guys abstracts in advance and I'm trying to exactly give some ethical inputs on some of the points they were making. It's by the nature of it a little bit chaotic, possibly, because it's kind of like a fishing exposition. So I'm trying to say as an ethicist, one of these guys said, let's give some ethical inputs. We talk about the role of patients a lot, um, the role of participants, and I will make a difference there, role of patient organizations, clinical trial recruitment. You were talking about, a lot about Christoph, and standard treatments versus comparative, et cetera. It's a huge thing. But first of all, before I start going into those things, I'd like in a nano conference to make a cigarette-like forward warning about nano ethics can damage your health and the mind the gap problematic. Okay, you're all in the nano field, so you're at the forefront of serious emerging science is what we call it. So you guys are doing things which haven't been done before. You, it's enabling technologies, the technologies, duh. That's the whole point. That's why it's sexy, that's why it's great, okay? Emerging science and technologies produce new opportunities for action that run ahead of the status quo. Well, of course they do. It's called innovation. And it also runs ahead, of course, of the research ethics. So it's normal, and people always criticize us, but actually it's quite normal that there's always a gap between what you guys are doing I mean, what's the ethics of a buckyball's facilities to cross the brain? Um, well, yeah. You are bringing us new questions, and we've got to decide what to do. So there's always this gap. And what actually I think nanoethics has done quite well compared to GM, and I know there was a lot of awareness in this, is that we're trying to have a balanced science society ethical discourse that needs to take place, how we develop nano science and technologies, to say it correctly, and to avoid the risk of a gap being filled by ill-informed backlash. I'm sure you're all aware of this. At the beginning of the nanoscience, we had Prince Charles talking about grey goo and stuff. And I think on the whole, we've done quite well to try and avoid also the scientists themselves. I've heard nanoscientists themselves at a very high level 
wanting to make their science more almost risk oriented. So we've got to be very careful. We don't hide any risk, but we have to be very, very honest to avoid a moratorium which is unnecessary in the nano field. And the problem is that you get speculative ethics sometimes, uh, which can leap ahead of the science through thought experiments and what ifs. And this speculative ethics, if it gets in the wrong throat, we'd say in German, can spoil the market for a balanced debate. Just as a bit of a, so we've got to be very careful, nanoethics, the ethics of ethics, which is something we need to write more about, is that as an ethicist, I have responsibilities as well, how I interact with you guys. And we don't want crystal ball ethics scaring people. Okay. Now then, I'm going to be really, really boring here. And for me, it's incredibly important, although we tend to use risk as a term, and I know we know what we mean by risk, it's still for me very important that we don't confuse risk and uncertainty, especially as being serious scientists, okay? Risk, you all know that. Risk calculation, exposure, vulnerability, probability, impact, consequences. So risk actually, if it has a point, is quite a rational, calculable, scientific thing, okay? And scientists, if we talk about risk, should be able to preci quite precisely inform patients about the risks of going into a therapy or a trial, of course. But when we're talking about the ethics of research and what you guys are doing as fundamental scientists doing, doing nanotech stuff, we're talking about a lot of uncertainty, which is quite a different category. It's about something you don't know. Okay. And in fact, research should involve uncertainty rather than risk. Because as we've heard, otherwise a trial, if it's not looking at something we don't know, is basically a waste of money. And for me, it's quite conceptually important as scientists doing risk work to be clear what's uncertainty and what's risk. And in fact, one could say one view of nanomedicine would be to say that what we're trying to do in this long process is to move from uncertainty, we don't know, synthetic nanoparticles, do they cross barriers, etc., to having an understanding of the risk. For me, it's a kind of, you probably think I'm being a bit fussy, but for me, these, these conceptual ways of thinking are very, very important in ethics. Um, I think I'll skip that one for time reasons. We've heard a lot from, now I'm going to focus a bit more on what the other speakers have said. And we've heard a lot about recruiting in clinical trials. Now, this is a subject which I thought, I thought about enough. Um, there's nothing more to be said. But actually, when I was working on today's presentation, I thought, we've not finished thinking through this, this, th 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 this issue for me. And so I'm being a bit explorative in my own thinking here. And when I started thinking about recruiting people to take part in trials and how we do this uncertainty risk analysis, what I've decided for myself is that when we're recruiting, we need to be very careful how we're talking about the participants. And there are trial participants who, on one level, must be altruistic. Because as we've heard, you don't know whether there's a benefit. If you knew there was going to be a benefit, you'd have to doubt whether the clinical trial should be financed, because the idea of science is to find out what you don't know. Okay. So it's kind of, I think we've got our knickers in quite a twist, actually, with the ethics of science about some of these things. But then for me, there's another way. These same people who are taking part as a trial participant, because they want to do something good, and they should know there are risks. You've also got, of course, that they are also at the same time patients. Okay, And we shouldn't forget that, of course, these patients, they're treating physician, their first commitment must be to their well-being. So we, we have an, an incredible tension in the whole clinical trial situation. Because I've, I've, I'm also a cancer patient, which is great, because it's given me an insight. Um, so if I, if I will be in a trial, I'm doing it for an altruistic person, but then there's also the part of me that's a patient. And of course, what I should not do is expect benefit because a trial has to have uncertainty. And I think it's very important when we analyze this kind of thing that we just keep these categories in line. A side issue here, we've already heard about this. I mean, you guys are, might be involved in, de in designing clinical trials. And a lot of the ethical problems that can come up in who should we recruit for trials, how do we treat them, how do we explain risk and benefit, is the need, which you beautifully said, for immaculate trial design an input from patient organizations. And this, funny, this, this trial design point is a very, very important point. 
And patient organisations, we need to involve them. As a side issue, the interesting thing is, who should patient organisations really represent? Are they renting? They're not, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that patient organisations, they're not really actually representing primarily, are they? The person participating, I think, imagine, they are primarily looking in the future, the future patient who's sick because you've got a patient. I mean, I don't know, but I think these are things we really need to, to be clear about. Who do they represent? Who should they represent? And this is something also I thought, I must talk to patient organisations more about who they're representing. Now, then, leading on from this, sorry if it's getting complex, but it is complex. <coughs> There's a conundrum which, every time I look at this kind of thing, I, I, I don't understand myself, and I'm trying here to understand it better, that we seem to have a fundamental issue here, that there is a conundrum between respecting and protecting the informed trial participants' altruistic wish to take part, and how to protect them in the role as a patient and not forgetting that the R&D long-term aim is to benefit future patients. So we've got a lot of intergenerational things going on here. The patient has a lot of, a lot of roles. Now then, I'll speed up a bit here. What I found when I'm consulting Hoffman La Roche, when I'm working for the European Commission, is <sighs> be analytical, be orderly. And I've developed a way of thinking the tree of knowledge and seeing it as a process. And that whenever we're looking at anything, research, design, anything, be aware of what we're part of. Don't focus on one thing. That, of course, the tree of knowledge, the research process, research question, non-clinical, clinical research, participant patients, uncertainty, going up to risks. For me, these, using these kind of models really helps when I'm thinking about clinical trials and ethics. Imp involvement of patient organisations, very important people as participants in their various roles. We have various duties towards them in their various roles. What's another very important aspect for me of thinking about clinical trials, research generally, is to be aware, of course, that although we're focusing now on the patient, here, good science demands that we've got a good research question, we've covered this beautifully, we know the aims, it's tight, it's good, it's something we don't know, we need excellent science. We've then got a whole level of approvals, of course, if you're going to clinical trial. Then we have the participant, the patient being asked. And my point is that only if we've done a jolly good job down here as scientists, should we, are we justified in involving a patient? But here, we've got to make sure that we've designed a clinical trial that is tight and as good as possible. We can never rely on informed consent. It should be a formality in a way as scientists because we know what we're doing is the best possible. Then, of course, after the trial, you've got excellent science needed again, knowledge generation, approvals. So for me, it's important to see we are part of this and decisions are being taken and responsibilities as scientists at various points. And I don't think we're always aware of just what we're doing. So the concluding, oh, sorry, concluding few comments. For me, it helps as an ethicist looking at this kind of complexity. Go back to basics. How can we justify working with humans? Look at whole process. Be aware of different responsibilities. Be clear about the weight of the decision when the risks and uncertainties allow a trial to commence. Assess uncertainties and risks separately. Of course, trial participants must be honestly informed of uncertainties and risks. Consider trial participants as altruistic participants on one hand, and also as patients who take part. One thing I'm very keen on is this cost-benefit balancing process I'm not in favour of. I think it's something to be careful about. Some costs are so great, they cannot be justified by benefits. And actually, if, I say, if we're doing a trial, we're not sure of the benefits. So, I mean, I think that actually a lot of the whole work on clinical trials is based on a misnomer and how do you do a cost-benefit analysis really in a clinical trial where you don't know something but anyway well I mean, it, it is no it's incredible it's a fundamental thinking errors here philosophers we are horrible right and avoid a mindset of over delegating risk decisions to patients so this is basically i won't go through these but it's just the kind of things the conundrums as well so that's it Final, they all say you should end with a joke. It's not a very funny talk, is it? It's my favourite slide about nanoparticles. <laughs> 
I think this is a great slide. You got it? I don't think so there. It's got nothing to do with my talk, but I like the slide. Anyway, I've been a bit over, sorry. I'm finished. Not much over, actually. I was quite good. <laughs> <laughs>